Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 387th episode, we have a bunch of news which are on a dinosaur extinction theme. And carrying on with that theme, we have an interview with Riley Black, also about dinosaur extinction. And we have dinosaur of the day, Macrogryphosaurus, which eventually went extinct, <laughs> like all the other non-avian dinosaurs. By extinction thing, we mean the day that dinosaurs, the non-avian dinosaurs died specifically, because yeah. you could argue that every episode is an extinction theme episode for us. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but before we get into all of that extinction theminess, we want to thank some of our patrons. And this week, we have a new patron to thank, and that's Croasaur. Thank you very much, Croasaur, for joining our fabulous community of dinosaur enthusiasts. And rounding out our shoutouts, we've got Bill Jago, Jackson Crawford, Ermel, Remy Rodriguez, Danny Hermes, James Pasco, Achilosaurus, Sophie, and Wouter. Yes, thank you so much for being part of our dinosaur community and, you know, going into these deep dives on dinosaur extinction with us. <laughs> <laughs> Jumping into the news doesn't get old. <laughs> it really doesn't. <laughs> there was... An article, Shea Mary critiqued the Marshall et al. paper that came out last year that was estimating there were billions of T-Rex. Mm. And this critique was published in Frontiers of Biogeography. And basically it said, well, we can't precisely estimate how many T-Rex there were. Yeah. I mean, that was sort of a conclusion that they had in the paper. The error bars on it were huge, if I remember right. It was something like, tens or hundreds of millions to billions, and yeah. Yeah, this sort of just, I guess, breaks down what the original paper used to estimate the T-Rex population and what could be difficult about using those as your estimates for your variables. Oh, okay, so not even looking at the conclusion. They were looking at even the, the beginning part of the paper, the assumptions they were making, and they didn't even like that piece of it. I don't know if I say they didn't like, but... Yeah, that seems strong. <laughs> well, first I want to start with the paper starts with a quote from Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And I love that book, so I wanted to share it. And it says, quote, we demand rigidly defined areas of doubt and uncertainty. <laughs> <laughs> that is basically statistics for you. Mm -hmm. It also states that, quote, estimating absolute population density is very difficult. That's not from the Hitchhiker's Guide. Now we're into the paper. Yeah, it's not nearly <laughs> as pithy as Douglas Adams. <laughs> I don't know if I'd categorize Douglas Adams as pithy. Definitely witty and funny, but... That quote's pretty pithy. It's a, it's like nine words. Okay, yes, I'll give you that. I just remember one of my favorite scenes, and this is completely off topic, <laughs> is like a whole scene of a whale appears out of nowhere and is falling down to the ground and is thinking to itself like, you know, thoughts of consciousness and like, oh, this is great. And this, what a wonderful world. And I'm totally paraphrasing because it's been a little while. And like, am I a whale? What kind of figuring out what it is? And then like, oh, this looks really cool. And the world is so wide and wonderful. And it's coming at me really fast and then splat. And then there's a plant, I think it was pansies, something like that, that pops up, also falls to the ground and just thinks to itself, oh, no, not again. And that took a few pages. So that's why I think not pithy necessarily. But see, the pansy part of it was still pithy. Fair point. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back to the dinosaurs. The paper also says, quote, unfortunately, I think that there, meaning the Marshall et al. paper, estimates for densities and population sizes of Tyrannosaurus rex are more precise than the data they use to allow and are stated with two narrow intervals, end quote. So what that paper used to estimate the T-Rex population, that included body size, the diet, and metabolic rate. And they said, quote, those are associated with substantial uncertainties. Some were considered, others neglected, end quote. So for example, we don't know exactly the metabolic rate of T-Rex. And though it was estimated based on somewhere between the rates of living reptiles and living birds and mammals, the paper, this paper, said that there was no direct support for a midpoint position, and the original paper should have used a range of values instead. It's also really hard to know how T-Rex density varied, meaning 
how many tyrannosaurs there were in a given area, the population, because that can vary seasonally. It can also vary based on the environment where they lived, and they could have lived in a lot of different types of environments. Yeah, I guess. I mean, it's definitely hard to estimate how dense they were. We talked a little bit about how animals that look similar by their bones can have very different population densities, like the difference between jaguar and lions, I think was the example, mm-hmm. where one, there's like 100 times as many density-wise than the other, even though if you look at their skeletons, they look fairly similar. And that's even knowing a baseline for cats. Right. We have no baseline for what a huge tyrannosaurus size and you know reptile animal would be like, so we don't even have that basis to start from. Yeah. And then the critique also says that there's different ways to estimate the size of tyrannosaurus rex. And depending on how you do it, you'll get a different estimate for its size. And also the fact that you average across different ages, quotes, it requires the sex and age specific survival rates to be known, end quote. So it's hard to assess with how T-Rex changed ontogenetically. And also we know that it changed what it ate as it grew up. Why do we have to know which gender or which sex of T-Rex survived more than the other in order to figure out the size size they would be? I think it's because if there is some kind of sexual dimorphism in the size, that could affect things. It's about averaging the masses across all different ages of T-Rex. Okay, so they're saying you can't average all of them because we're averaging too many variables into one number basically. Yeah. So I think they're talking about different age cohorts and how you want to know the minimum age for those cohorts and then reconstruct the body sizes for those specific age groups. Oh, okay. I see. So if you are talking about density in an area and there are like juvenile groups or you have a, a higher density of some ages than other ages, you need to know that distribution of ages, <laughs> and then maybe even some behavioral stuff there in order to figure out the details. I think so. Now, the paper ends with, quote, we can set parameters for many factors, but unless we use reasonable measures of uncertainty and propagate them when one uncertain parameter is multiplied by another, such endeavors will only give an illusion of accuracy and precision, end quote. But like you said, Garrett, we talked about this paper, the original paper, Marshall and All, in episode 335 as our fun fact. And the authors did acknowledge that the Monte Carlo simulations they use, quote, do not accommodate uncertainties that might stem from the choices made in the design of our approach. Mm -hmm. So I think overall, though, it's just a good reminder. We're always learning. Science is built on previous research. And for further studies, it's good to keep these factors in mind and these variabilities. Yeah, I mean, the one of the big advantages to Monte Carlo simulations is that you don't have to plug in average values because you can take a range of values and multiply them by a range of other values and you get, you're basically multiplying or adding a bell curve to another bell curve and you get like a broader bell curve basically with a wider range of options. But I guess the problem is even though they did a Monte Carlo simulation and they did a lot of distributed values, they did use some averages And for those averages, I guess they weren't very well backed up. Mm. So they should have used more ranges. And that would have ended up with a much broader set of data. And like these researchers are saying, they ended up with a more specific conclusion than they should have because they didn't include all of the uncertainty. Yeah. And it was already really, it was several orders of magnitude of uncertainty (laughs) to begin with. So you, you end up with, instead of going from tens of millions to billions, maybe it's just single digit millions to hundreds of billions or trillions or something. Yeah. And then it's like at a certain point you wonder why even bother. Oh, <laughs> if you're only narrowing it down to like six orders of magnitude though. But it's fun to think about. What was it like two and a half billion T Rex mm-hmm. was the average or something? Over the span of all T Rex. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was fun to see that there were more humans already than there were T Rex over all those millions of years. Yeah. We are a lot smaller though. Yes. <laughs> and other news, before we get into our extinction theme here, in Missouri, the House recently voted to update the name of their state dinosaur from Hypsibima to Parasaurus. And we talked about this dinosaur in episode 269, 
So currently, the state dinosaur of Missouri is Hypsobema missouriensis, which is fitting. Now, in 1945, it was known as Parasaurus, but then the name was changed in 1979 to Hypsobema. And in 2018, some scientists said that it should be changed back to Parasaurus. So that's what they're doing in this House Bill 1629 is that name change for the state dinosaur to be Parasaurus. I'm not entirely sure what happens next or how long the process will take, but it is interesting that they want to keep up with the science there. Yeah, and it's still going to be Parasaurus missouriensis. Mm -hmm. That's the official name. So it's not like it's losing the Missouri-ness of it. Yep. Like, you know how there's Arkansas. If Arkansas gets <laughs> synonymized, then it's going to be oh, kind of funny because it won't be an actual dinosaur anymore. Not to say that that's going to happen with Arkansas. I don't think it will. But yeah, that's always the risk. And it's still based on a specimen found in Missouri. Yep. Yeah, they found more of them. That was partly what sparked this. Yeah, probably. In Toronto, Canada, a group of people dressed up in inflatable dinosaur costumes to celebrate the Toronto Raptors competing in the playoffs and Jurassic Park reopening. Jurassic Park reopened? Yeah, that's that public square they have where people can gather to oh. view the playoff games in Toronto. Okay. The, the, yeah, I was thinking Jurassic Park, like the island with yeah. Jurassic Park. I was very confused. I thought that at first, too, and then I had to look it up, and then I remembered it. We've been to that Jurassic Park. We have, yeah. It's just a basically a plaza. Yeah. <laughs> so that would have been fun to see. They strolled around town one morning last week. In Dinosaur Media News, the Smithsonian is making exclusive products with Jurassic World Dominion. That includes the Jurassic World Dominion Smithsonian Prehistoric Projector. Ooh, that's a mouthful. <laughs> what is, wait, it's a projector? Yeah, it's a projector that shows different dinosaurs from the movie. I guess there's 24 dinosaurs and prehistoric animals, and it includes paleontology facts. How do, what? <laughs> <laughs> like I, it has slides in it? Like a slide projector? I only saw a picture of it. Or is it one of those projectors like you sort of a, a nightlight? Yeah. Okay. So it's like a kid nightlight situation. Yeah. It that turns and like shows the stuff slowly around the room. I don't think it turns. It looks kind of like a a light that you would project onto the wall. It's very interesting. Yeah. They also have the Jurassic World Dominion Smithsonian Amber Dig. <laughs> 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 and each amber piece has a plant or insect or feather. I assume it's not real amber. No. Because those are really expensive. It just looks like amber. wonder if anyone will try to pass those off as real. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would as a kid, but... Oh. Maybe. I might just think they were real in the first place, actually. Yeah, maybe. Now, next, Past Eons Productions is recreating the BBC Walking with Dinosaurs documentary using Jurassic World Evolution 2 mods. Interesting. Yeah, they recently released Season 2. They also made their own spinoff, A Walk with Dinosaurs, and they're really well done. It's very pretty to see. So if you're looking for something, well, even more dinosaur media to watch, that's a good option. It's one way to do a recreation of Walking with Dinosaurs. Just use video game footage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Jurassic World Evolution dinosaurs are actually fairly realistic. They're more realistic than a lot of the ones that are in the movies, too. Hmm. So then it's a good place to go. And last in the news, we got a chance to watch Dinosaurs the Final Day, which is the David Attenborough documentary, I'm going to call it. Yeah, it's a documentary. It's the one that came out in the UK last week, and it's coming out in the US soon. Yes. May 11th. It showed a lot of the stuff we were expecting. I think the highlight of it was that dinosaur leg. Oh, yeah. Which looks really cool. It is just a leg. There isn't more of the dinosaur shown in the documentary. The shoulder. The shoulder got mixed up with the leg. Oh, I missed that part. <laughs> yeah. It was part of this thing they called a log jam, which was a bunch of fossils and ejecta from the meteor. And one theory is that there was basically a tsunami from the impact that traveled up to the Tainus site via the Western Interior Seaway, and it killed a lot of fish because it also hit while there were all these ejecta coming, and the ejecta were found in the gills, and everything got all jammed up, a log jam, <laughs> with all these different fossils. 
including this dinosaur leg fossil that also had a shoulder very close to it. Mm, Yeah. And it looks like some of the bones were broken in a way, like it might have been a sort of traumatic tumbling in the water. And they built an interesting story around it, saying that since they presume it was probably a Thessalosaurus or a Thessalosaur more generally, that maybe Thessalosaurus fled into the water when they were getting chased by predators, which is a pretty out there hypothesis. I don't think anybody's really peer-reviewed that claim yet. But if that were to be the case, if something large or just another predator was chasing it and it ran into the water thinking this is a safe place to be, Mm -hmm. when all that water was rushing in, that would be trouble for it. Equally troubling, though, would be if it was just hanging out on the shore yeah. and all of a sudden a huge wave came in and washed it away. There was no good place for it to be. No, no. There was no good place to be, period, in the Hell Creek when that meteor hit. Yeah. They went into a lot of detail in that, actually, in the documentary because they were talking about those glass spherules or microtectites, they're sometimes called, where the glass that formed from the impactor, so the meteor hits the ground, it basically evaporates a lot of the ground. It goes up into the air and then it condenses while it's in the air into little spheres, just like hail condensing as from water and then rains back down. But the problem is when something condenses, it releases a lot of heat. So that heat releasing lights forests on fire. And on top of that, they're small and they can get stuck in fish gills. And that part has been peer reviewed. That was the first thing we heard about the Tana site Mm -hmm. was a bunch of fish that looked like they had gotten rocked around like you were talking about the log jam and then also had a bunch of these little pieces of glass stuck in their gills, presumably suffocating them. And then now we've got this Thessalosaur shoulder slash leg. And then they also showed one thing we didn't know in advance was a piece of Triceratops skin which was really cool, or at least they presume it's Triceratops Oh, I think skin. we did know about that one. Yeah, it was skin and a horn. It's really neat. It, it looks very realistic. Both the leg and the skin remind me of something you would see on one of those fleshed out animatronics. Mm-hmm. It's got that pebbly sort of bumpy scale structure to it, and it just it looks really cool. They think with the Triceratops, though, and this is based on the horn, there were these fractures that went right through it. So they were thinking, oh, was it killed in a fight instead of as a result of the impact? But then they saw signs of new bone growth. So it looks like it survived the event that broke its horn. Mm. But it's unclear if it survived until the day of the impact. There was sagging of the skin, which they said suggested decay. So the body started to rot before it was buried. And because of that, they're thinking, well, probably didn't die because of the crater. That might be a good thing. Yeah. I'm not sure. I don't which know. Way, depending on the specifics of how you go. But they, I think that one went too. They talked about how the skin had scars on it too, potentially being scraped mm. by either horns or a predator or something like that, which is really, really cool. I didn't expect to see that. I guess you had seen it before, but I didn't. But the Thessalosaurus, they think, could have died from the impact because There were no obvious tooth marks or signs that it had been eaten and the bones looked okay. So it was probably healthy when it died. Plus, it was part of that log jam. Yeah. And then that telescoping bone problem that looks like a really traumatic injury. Yes. An interesting analogy, I thought, was that they're saying these dinosaurs or these animals were quickly entombed like how we see the people who were entombed after Pompeii. Yeah, the, when Vesuvius erupted, mm-hmm. it is kind of similar in that way, especially considering the relation to a huge natural catastrophe like that. There are a few other highlights. Well, they talked about it being late spring, which has also been peer reviewed. Yeah, but we should mention the dinosaur finds haven't been peer reviewed yet. So we'll probably find out more about those later. And if those hypotheses make it past the peer review process. Yeah. There's a lot of footprints from the site, too, so I'm sure there'll be papers about those. Mm -hmm. They also talked about the pterosaurs and how they had crests that might have been used for display. It could be that the males had crests and the females didn't, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, I mean, everybody likes to throw out sexual dimorphism hypotheses that Mm -hmm. are usually really hard to prove. But the pterosaurs didn't do well either in the impact. Yeah, so they made a video recreation of the impact or event, and they basically show one of these Asdar kid 
giant pterosaurs falling out of the sky and like bashing into a tree really dramatically. It's, mm -hmm. it's very sad. Yep. So if you're in air, you're not safe. If you're on land, you weren't safe. They showed a T-Rex basically being engulfed by flames mm -hmm. because you had the seismic events, then you had the tsunami, and then the atmosphere got so hot mm -hmm. that it sparked wildfires. Yeah. And then the water isn't safe either because it's all rushing in multiple directions. So there's tons of debris in it. And to that end, they found a turtle that looked like it was impaled by a stick. Mm -hmm. And they think that maybe it was in the water and got tumbled around and shoved onto a stick, which is a pretty reasonable guess. They also showed that turtle. They had this minutes after the impact kind of thing up to maybe 33 minutes. And they kept showing flashes of the turtle mm -hmm. swimming, and we kept thinking, okay, when does it Here get impaled? Here goes the turtle, yeah. <laughs> but the, the turtle kept being fine, and then eventually it wasn't fine. Yeah. The best place to be, which is something we've talked about before, were the small mammals that had the burrows. Yeah, of course, whenever you're talking about the dinosaur extinction, you have to show the little mammals surviving because, you know, that's important to us. Yep. <laughs> They did also show some sauropods, presumably Alamosaurus, down maybe in Texas mm. when they were saying, you know, things that were really close to the impactor fared the worst and immediately basically got wiped out. They just very briefly showed some sauropods because there weren't any sauropods in the Hell Creek that we know of. Yeah. As I pointed out when Garrett was like, oh, the poor turtles. <laughs> I was like, it, it survived the sauropods. And then you were like, there, there are no even sauropods. sauropods. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to do with it. It was a poorly placed log or stick. Mm -hmm. But that, yeah, that's also just a good reminder of how big of an impact this had because Tainus is almost 2,000 miles away from where the asteroid hit, the yeah. Chicxulub. But these ejectas kind of sh help show that the two areas were linked. Yeah, they found a piece of potentially the Chicxulub meteorite in the sediment. Yeah. When they did the chemistry on it, they were like, oh, there's a bunch of nickel and some other metals in this, which looks meteorite-like. Yep. So maybe that's what it came from. I think it was iron and chromium were the other two, which they say would match what you'd expect from a piece of meteorite. Yeah. I don't know if the core samples that we they drilled, oh, they drilled in the peak ring. Mm -hmm. They didn't drill in the middle of the crater. Someone's going to have to go back to Chicxulub and drill right down in the middle of the crater mm. and see if they can get any of the actual asteroid or meteor. Uh, it's hard to say which one it is. We go back and forth. But if they can find any of that in that actual impact site, there might be some in the peak ring. I can't remember if they found anything that they thought was pieces of meteorite. But it would be good to have that comparison because then that could be a good way in the future, in addition to the iridium layer, to seeing and confirming that it was the Chicxulub impactor in that sediment, if you find actual little pieces of it with that chemical signature. Yeah. So one of the quotes from the documentary is Attenborough saying, there is no escaping the destruction, which is very apt. And in less than two hours, the world has changed forever, which can you imagine that drastic of a change in that short amount of time? Yeah. Yeah. They mentioned how in those couple of hours, there were probably some animals that went completely extinct, which is just crazy mm -hmm. that an entire species would go extinct in that short a period of time. But on top of that, in those couple of hours, you've got 99% basically of the land animals dying, not of the species entirely, but of the individuals of the species mm -hmm. because it's just such a traumatic event. You know, it's just the ones that happen to be underground or in just the right conditions where they survive the fire and the flood and the earthquake and the tsunamis and all that. Yeah, you'd have to have a fair amount of luck to survive all that. But it's a good documentary. Highly recommended. Mm -hmm. We're definitely looking forward to seeing the papers that come out of this because I want to see what the peer review community thinks of all these discoveries. Yes. Yeah, it looks like there's been a bit of a debate on social media about, you know, all these theories coming out. But mm -hmm. it's interesting to see. And it's cool to see, you know, what could have happened, even if we don't know for sure, being able to visualize some of these. I mean, it was obviously traumatic and intense. And yeah, being able to see that just kind of hits home more. Yeah. Yeah, most of it, I thought they were pretty conservative in what they recreated, where it was all stuff that 
isn't really controversial. You know, like big waves washing in. They showed the tsunami, which has been peer reviewed multiple times. Mm -hmm. They talked about the fire and the tektites and all that kind of stuff, which everybody pretty well agrees on. The only one that I thought was a little bit out of left field in terms of not being peer reviewed was the Thessalosaur <laughs> running away from T Rex mm. to swim away and then instinctively running into the water. I thought that was probably a pretty unusual, <laughs> maybe not likely explanation for what happened. Yeah, but who knows in, in future papers, because they've got tracks, if they're able to connect the tracks to a specific type of dinosaur, maybe. Maybe, yeah. It's just one of those things where once it's, if it is a really popular show and mm -hmm. a lot of people have seen it, they're going to assume that that's because you've seen it now. Right. So you feel like that must be how it happened because I saw it happen. Right. That's how you know, our brains work at least. Yeah. And it's important in that it opens us up to what happened on that day and gives us more information, at least on the background of the impact. So yes, definitely recommend it. And of course, we're also looking forward to <laughs> David Attenborough's other documentary series, Prehistoric Planet. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That one looks even prettier. Mm -hmm. And in just a moment, we're going to go on to our interview with Riley Black. But first, real quick, we're going to pause for a sponsor break. And now on to our interview with Riley Black. But of course, as always, we have an extended version of this interview for our patrons. So if you would like to hear a longer version of it, which I highly recommend because we went in all sorts of interesting directions. Oh, yeah. Then definitely check out your premium content feed. And in the interview, of course, we get into Riley's new book, The Last Days of Dinosaurs, which is very excellent. And I'll let you listen to the full thing. But it talks about the immediate effects of the impact, but also looks at different time periods afterwards, the ripple effect. So we are joined this week by Riley Black, a science writer and communicator whose work has appeared in Smithsonian, National Geographic, and Scientific American. She also recently was in the PBS Nova Alaskan Dinosaurs, and she has written a number of books, including The Last Days of Dinosaurs, An Asteroid Extinction and the Beginning of Our World, which came out this week. Thank you so much for joining us again. Oh, thank you for having me back. It's been a minute, but I'm always glad to talk about dinosaurs. <laughs> yes. And there's so much to talk about. Like you're, I feel like your name pops up all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for this book, The Last Days of Dinosaurs, mm -hmm. what inspired you to write it? Because it's, it's so different from a lot of other books we've read about dinosaurs. Yeah. So there are kind of two answers to that. And one has just been the fascination with the KPG extinction in general. And I've certainly been guilty of this in some of my books and some of my articles where traditionally like it gets yada yada. We kind of go like, you know, the dinosaurs are thriving. There was an asteroid, yada, yada, yada. We get the Cenozoic. <laughs> and I think we never really unpack like what transpired. You know, the information is in the technical literature. Some of it's theoretical. Some of it's a little bit more tangible, but all the same, it's like, we treat this impact as if it were completely obvious. Like, you know, Earth gets smacked with an asteroid, extinction happens. Only we know that's not true. We know there are like bigger craters out there that are not tied to mass extinctions of any kind. So this really was, as I started to think about the worst case scenario that there ever was, particularly in that, like, it was the worst day the planet mm -hmm. ever had. This is something that's relatively rare and that really was captivating to me, that most other mass extinctions, they took place over hundreds of thousands of years, perhaps even a million years or more. This extinction, the main pulse was in 24 hours, mm -hmm. followed by three years of sort of, you know, increased extinction, but not quite as bad as that first day. So this really was as close as we can get to just, like, this pivotal moment where everything is basically going along as it always had, and then the world just flips. Mm -hmm. And that just, I find, really, really compelling. That wasn't the slow, grinding sort of change, but it was almost instantaneous. And it just fundamentally changed our planet. And the second part of it, it actually has a connection to this podcast. So I don't want to get too real, I guess, about this. But the last time that I spoke to you, we recorded our podcast. And you were talking about dinosaurs. It was super fun. I went out to the living room and I had a conversation with the person I was married to at the time and found out that I was getting divorced. And that began a very, let me say, trying and difficult, but also good 
time in my life because like through during that time period, I was also coming out. It was the beginning of my transition. It was this sharp break between life as I kind of knew it and this new life that was very uncertain that it was kind of coming into. So I really related to the KPG extinction as a personal metaphor, even that I kind of had my own age of reptiles that was going on. And then like in a moment, everything felt like it was kind of like burnt to cinders. And I need to figure mm-hmm. out what's wondering what the future is going to look like and what that new growth is going to look like and sort of the growth out of the remnants of what was into something that's new and different and vibrant. So really just on a personal level, it really resonated with me, this idea of, you know, catastrophe isn't convenient, but, you know, that classic Jurassic Park line of, you know, life uh, finds a way. Mm-hmm. And it really resonated in that sense. Yeah, I I mean, I really enjoyed reading your book and the way the structure is and like how you're talking about it. It's like the day before the impact, the impact, the first hour, first day, first month, and then one year, hundred years, thousand years. It goes on for a little bit, and then, and then at the end too, you've you've kind of tied it back to on a more personal note with your journey, and uh, it just yeah, it all felt very cinematic in a way. Oh, thank you. I mean, that was really, I love movies and I love dinosaur movies and I love cinema in general. And that was the way that I thought about it. I'm glad that came through because I thought about, okay, where am I directing the reader's gaze and all this? And just to backtrack for just one moment about sort of the process that I took to write it or the way that I wrote it. You know, we have so many books about dinosaurs and about paleontology, and they often fall into groups like you have your encyclopedias and you have your memoirs by paleontologists and you know, kind of your news that you can use pop science stuff. And you know, I've written a couple of books like that. There's certainly plenty out there, but I wanted to do something that was entirely different, something that was new, something that I hadn't tried before. And that really put people there because we have books already about, you know, the debates around the KPG boundary and, you know, why the uh, non-even dinosaurs went extinct and all, all these sorts of topics from like the history of science or the sort of process of science sort of view. So I really thought as I was thinking through this, it was hard not to imagine what this was like and think about a sense of time, a sense of place, what was going on. Some of these chapters are more difficult to write than others. Like we don't necessarily have a great understanding of what was going on 100,000 years after impact, or I think 10,000 years, that was it, 10,000 years after impact. That's kind of, I can make my guesses. Mm -hmm. And that's what some of the book is. And that's why the appendix is there to really fill in, like these are the things that we know, these are the things that are speculative. This is the stuff that I just made up because I thought it was cool and scientifically backed. But I really felt like, you know, a narrative story. This is a story of a, a turning point would be much more effective than me kind of trying to retread some of these same kind of processes or rhetorical sort of approaches that have been done before. And again, it felt like, you know, this, this is the first trade book that I have under my real name. This is the first book that I've really written, you know, during that time period, like I started writing this book during the early days of my transition, it felt like a good opportunity to be like, you know, I've been doing the same thing for a number of years. This is a great chance to just try something entirely new and see how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you for sharing that. It's really awesome. Yeah. Yeah. The cool thing about writing a story that way too, and adding a personal aspect to it is we've seen that usually those books are the most popular. I mean, (laughs) you talk about like Roy Chapman Andrews, it's very personal, his experience. Steve Brusati's book, you know, is very personal about his experience. And yeah, so you're, it's a different type of experience than I've seen linked to a paleontology story. And that gives you a different perspective on it. And I love the idea of looking at the extinction event in terms of a personal journey, because it's almost always like, at the 10,000 foot view of, you know, there were this genus before and afterwards they were gone and now it's this genus. But you don't think about it on the personal level of like, well, what was actually going on with an animal? Mm -hmm. Because an animal doesn't go extinct, an animal dies. And it's a very different sort of way to look at it, especially like you were saying, when it's the singular event and then in the years that follow and all that, it's just Thank you for writing it. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm glad that you liked it. And I really wanted to take that approach because 
you could really get a sense of, you know, how these animals were living. Like, you know, somebody in early readers said, like, your dinosaurs are gross. And that's what I was going <laughs> for. It's like, they throw up, they have lice, they have parasites. Like, you know, they think about mating rituals and all that sort of stuff. I think that's important because so often when we think and see dinosaurs, they're kind of pristine. Mm -hmm. They're kind of like you know, at, in peak health. They're usually like the largest example of their species, all this stuff. Like, I know there's a lot of paleo art now, especially on Twitter. We really are in the golden age of paleo art that kind of bucks that trend. But still, like what the general public is usually familiar with are sort of these almost like impervious animals in this perfectly running sort of habitat. And I was like, no, it's kind of messy. And if I were writing a book from a more removed standpoint, I was just talking about the science and saying like, you know, in 2006, researchers reported in Nature and like doing that journalistic take on it, no one's really going to care about what the lice were doing or what ferns were doing or what ostracods were doing or any of that stuff. They want to hear about the dinosaurs. So I figured by kind of coming down to that more personal view by thinking about, okay, what are these, how are these animals trying to survive? What are they doing? What kind of adaptations do they have? What does that tell us about what was going on? It adds stakes to it. There's a reason to care about them. There's a reason to be invested in these things that otherwise we might just skip entirely over. Because that's part of the story, right? Is that we still often focus on the non-avian dinosaurs and their fate, mm -hmm. that we forget that this was a mass extinction that wiped out 75% of known species and drastically affected ecology and how ecology works. Like, yeah. I was thinking about this the other day about oh, during the, you know, sort of heyday of the non-avian dinosaurs, you know, forests would have been very different. They would have had to be big enough or at least spaced out enough for these huge animals to move through because they were knocking over trees and trampling down plants and things like that. And then after the impact and during life's recovery, all these forests grew up, but they were much denser. There was so much more sort of like surface area and like micro environments within those. And that really revved up the diversification that followed afterwards. So it had this, you know, it wasn't just a change in terms of who survived, but just like the way that nature worked in yeah. a sense, these interactions. And that's really what I wanted to give people a sense of like, if you were there, how would you see all these things thread together that they really are interconnected? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, when you mentioned too the the seventy five percent of species going extinct, I remember hearing those sorts of numbers as a kid, and I always imagined, okay, so if you have a room full of ten people, that means afterwards you've got, well, I guess, two and a half people. Maybe I should have said twenty. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, a half a person become uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> but with in reality, when people talk about what it would have actually been like there, it was more like ninety nine point nine something percent of individuals died. So really, it's like you're in a room of a thousand people. There's like one person left. And I mean, you have to scale it up more so that you have enough species yeah. left. But really, on that daily basis, if you look at it more at a, a specific what was it like on the day, it's so much. It's actually even more bleak <laughs> than mm -hmm. it was on the grand scheme of things. The grand scheme of things is already pretty and bleak. Also thinking about how confusing it must have been. Oh, yeah. For the animals. Yeah, I mean, the fact that in those first 24 hours, so, you know, the asteroid impact and all that debris gets thrown up into the atmosphere, and as it's coming back down, it's creating friction. They create an infrared pulse. So basically, like, the world almost got, like, microwaved in a sense. Not that there were literal <laughs> microwaves, but it's that kind of thing. It's like air temperatures went up to about 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Like, that's hot enough that, like, forests were spontaneously bursting into flame, there's some estimates to suggest that all organic matter that was exposed on the surface might have been consumed by the heat and by the fires. So just, I really empathize that I do a little chapter on a mizodma, this little multi-tuberculate, so a squirrel-like mammal that lived during the time in its burrow and, you know, what she might have been experiencing. And thinking about that, like how, you know, you go to sleep and then you wake up and the world that you knew, it's basically just ash. Mm. And mm -hmm. how survival really was by literal inches that, you know, you needed to get underground or be under the water. There needed to be some kind of buffer. And when you start to think about it in those terms, it like the obviousness of it just like hits you. I remember as a kid seeing like the dinosaurs, that PBS documentary with all those great animated bits. And when they get to the extinction, you know, the dinosaurs are through this, going through this like dark ash field and they're all emaciated and it's very much the impact winter but now we know they did, probably didn't even make it that long. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it really struck me like how dramatic this was because it was always presented in this way of sort of like, okay, well, you've got debris and you've got dust and it blowed out the sun and everything else. But that it took like this long time for this to basically squeeze 
environments until there was nothing left. Mm -hmm. But it really was so much more dramatic yeah. than anyone had really expressed. So I wanted to capture some of that. And there's some things I'm probably wrong about, and I try and be honest about that in the appendix. But just really like that sense of like, my gosh, like, you know, you could be standing in ancient Hell Creek. You probably wouldn't even see it coming. Like mm -hmm. it's just moving so fast that it just happens. And then within the next day, ev everything is gone. Yeah. It's yeah. something on a scale that's just, it's, you know, it's Michael Bay movie dramatic, basically. Yeah. yeah. And the three of us live closer to the impact site than Hell Creek, too. So <laughs> yes. I remember we looked at there's there are these models where you can put in the size of an impact and then like how far away you are. And it'll tell mm -hmm. you, like, how big would the earthquake be? How big is the air mm -hmm. shock wave and all that? And we went through it, I can't remember, a couple of years ago on our podcast, and it was basically like, well, the first thing that would happen is we'd feel this crazy earthquake, and then everything would burst into flames, and then there'd be this shockwave, and then there'd be a tsunami, and mm -hmm. then, so it's like, keep going. even if you survive the first insane thing, there's like four mm -hmm. things behind it, and then even if you make through all that, then there's nuclear winter for a few years, mm -hmm. so. Right. I was remembering in, in your book, too, even in the beginning, it might have been that the water was safe. And if you were in the water, you were okay. But then shortly after, the water becomes too acidic, too hot, and, and then that becomes dangerous. So mm. even what you're doing to survive, how you have to keep adapting. Yeah, that it really was the luck of the draw. It was like these, they're not even pre-adaptations per se, but just like the circumstances of how and where certain organisms lived in terms of how they're able to survive. And that's why I had fun with the little acaroraptors, one of these non-avian mm -hmm. raptor dinosaurs that like survive for a little bit, but ultimately becomes extinct. There's no evidence that so far that they've made it, you know, into the Paleocene. But I like that idea that they were small enough to maybe make it through in burrows, but because they were carnivorous, there just wasn't food to eat. So like getting at that there are all these sort of intersecting circumstances where, okay, maybe you made it past this one barrier, but the next one might be something that's insurmountable. And it was really all these intersections, especially with the mammals. Like, you know, we often talk about mammals during the Mesozoic as, you know, they're small, they were diversifying, but they're like living in the shadow of the dinosaurs, where really, if mammals had been able to get bigger and able to diversify, their extinction would have been so much worse. Like the fact that they were <laughs> kind of had to live at small size and often lived in these niches that required burrowing underground or at least having refuge under there, like is what saved them in the end. So even though we kind of looked down on them in a way, it's like that stuff that ended up making the difference. That's a really interesting way to look at it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That it was it was a feature, not a bug. <laughs> exactly. Tiny. Yes. It's just waiting for the right time. <laughs> That's awesome. In your research, did you happen to come across an animal where you thought that's the one I would want to be during the <laughs> extinction event? <laughs> I really connected with uh, Mizodma, that little multi-tuberculate, there was just something about it. When I started writing the scene, I kind of made myself tear up a little bit because I was just thinking about these scrappy little mammals that have been like making it alongside non-avian dinosaurs for some time. And just that idea of like you're asleep and you wake up and the world is fundamentally changed. And now you need to find a way to survive through that. And somehow they did. And they were kind of like the ones that I was really rooting for through this, for whatever reason, just really connected to. And later in the book, in the last chapter before the conclusion, I really want to include Purgatorius as well, because it just, it still blows my mind that there were primates around during the same time, basically living in the same environments as T-Rex and survived the KPG disaster. They survived the extinction and made it out on the other side. So, you know, we, we can't say that Purgatorius was directly ancestral to us. It's just an indication that primates were around. Mm -hmm. But, like, even that for our own lineage, we didn't come after. We were there during, basically. <laughs> our ancestors were there during this event. We came so close to, like, not existing. It's just, like, the odds of that really just, like, struck me. Because we don't talk about it in these terms. We're so yeah. focused on the dinosaurs that we often forget that there are all these little connections to it. Like, especially in the conclusion, I want to draw through some of these things, like when you see a bee pollinating a flower, or you see like a can of beans at the supermarket, the fact that legumes evolved during the mm -hmm. Paleocene after the impact, you know, that all the birds that we see around us don't have teeth. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, the only dinosaurs that left all these little connections that, yeah, it's been a long time. It's been 66 million years, but if you know how to look for it, you can still see sort of the hallmarks 
of what that extinction did. And to me, that's utterly fascinating that we're still living kind of in the shadow of this event that we think of as so distant. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you've got a, a really good quote. Uh, Mass extinctions are terrible events that inadvertently clear the field for the survivors. Yeah, and we're all the survivors. Yeah. yeah. It's all we know, so it seems normal to us. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it, the irony that exists in these things. I mean, the more that we've learned, especially about, you know, to quote the title of Brusati's book, The Rise and Fall of Dinosaurs, it really gets to me that, you know, dinosaurs were the recipients of mass extinctions that occurred, mm -hmm. that you had the Permian mass extinction that allowed, you know, the age of reptiles to start and archosaurs to start to proliferate. And dinosaurs were there, but they were kind of on the sidelines for most of the Triassic. At the end of the Triassic, you have another mass extinction that clears out basically the croc a lot of the croc line competition and allows dinosaurs to diversify. So like they were the the recipients of good luck twice. Yeah. And then they had their kind of comeuppance at the end of the Cretaceous. <laughs> and that's just sort of like, none of this is intentional. It's just the way that life kind of goes. But it's kind of wild to me that, you know, we used to think about these animals as just like, as very dominant. Like it was so clear that they were meant to rule the earth and we're kind of like projecting backwards. But now it's like, they were kind of the underdogs and became these big, wonderful, terrifying, whatever word that you want to use to describe them things yeah. mm -hmm. that affected other organisms. And then when they disappeared, it allowed all this other life to come forth. It makes me wonder, like, kind of what's next? Like, I really seriously hope that we don't have a similar event like this <laughs> anytime soon. But it does make me wonder, like, if that were to happen, like, what would be the result? Like, who would be around to spark that next great diversification of life? What would, like, life look like and then we're getting to all like the Dougal Dixon new dinosaur stuff and that's a yeah. whole other speculative arm of it that's what I go with I go with uh, some sort of Antarctic bird like a, a mm. skewa or something <laughs> <laughs> and then it evolving huge again and turning into like a terror bird and eventually maybe getting teeth <laughs> yeah yeah, I, I would want to know what rats would do because like, <laughs> oh, one way or another yeah. they're just they're spread in so many places and they'd be able to like you know at least you know, shelter in a number of the underground spots that, that we've made. They're clearly resilient. Mm -hmm. So like if you just took, you know, your average brown rat, what would that creature become given, yep. you know, 10, 15, 20 million years? Would you have, would they become hyper carnivores or herbivores? Or would you have like, like dinosaurs that begins this whole group where they're all different from each other? All or what? rats. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's an awesome idea. Yeah, I was the first time I really thought about birds repopulating, I think was watching something on the Salton Sea in California, mm. where it's like, you know, just basically like a hellscape of toxic water. And it's mostly just like bugs and mm -hmm. flies and stuff. And then they show there's a bird there that can very specifically fly and catch these flies. And it's uh, you know, it's specialized for catching flies. And then they show a seagull running with its mouth just wide open, just hoping to catch a few <laughs> and eating dead fish and stuff. And it's like, that's the one you want to be in an extinction yeah. event. The seagull that mm -hmm. just has the stomach acid that can digest everything and is willing to just go for it. <laughs> yeah, generalists do well. Yeah. But I like that sense of bringing in real life observations into some of these things. Like in the first chapter after the introduction, or it's basically the day before impact. And mm -hmm. I write about the sort of triceratops bull who's passed away and this t-rex shows up to open up the carcass but there are already birds and pterosaurs there that was based upon experience that i had in yellowstone national park a number of years ago where a bison had died relatively close to the road and we, i was able to basically watch what unfolded over the next day and when they discovered basically the corpse of this bison and, you know, the park rangers cordoned everything off and, you know, watching from a safe distance, it was just ravens and golden eagles, basically the birds. And they were trying to pick at the eyes and the soft parts, but they couldn't really get into anything else. You got the sense that they were kind of mi milling around mm -hmm. in a sense. Mm -hmm. And just as sunset started to come down, this big grizzly bear comes from the tree line on the other side of the Hayden Valley and just makes a beeline. <laughs> for the carcass. And then it got dark. It's like, okay, well, we're going to come back first thing in the morning and have a look at this. And when it came back, there was this trade-off going on between a gray wolf and the grizzly where they'd kind of eat their full and move off and then go back and forth. And all the birds were picking up the scraps. And it really gave me this idea for this scene of like, wait, well, like the bigger herbivore, even the Mesozoic died, you know, all these little animals will probably be aware of it, but they can't open it up. They can't access what's in it. They're kind mm -hmm. of waiting for these larger carnivores to come by and open it up and begin that process of returning all this tissue, you know, into the ecosystem. So 
even though you know I'm dealing with an event that happened 66 million years later and very different animals, it's still like I felt like the concept was still so sound. And it really informed a lot of what I tried to write. And I tried to bring as much of that as I could into the writing, like these biological sort of reliances and interactions. This idea that we often talk about prehistoric life as if they're kind of isolated from each other. Like what did T-Rex do? What did Triceratops do? What did Amontosaurus do? But it's rare that we consider them sort of in relation to each other, the other organisms that were there, you know, even down to like what their microbiomes were like, Mm -hmm. what parasites that they had. So I really wanted to contribute to the sense that like an organism isn't an island. It's kind of like a set of interactions with the rest of the environment, all these little pushes and pulls that move evolution and ecology in all these different ways. Yeah. Yeah. Going back to your book at the end, we're mm-hmm. you're we're in present day and you talk about going on this 10 hour drive to see yes. the KPG <laughs> boundary in Colorado, which I had no idea mm-hmm. you could see that in Colorado. That's really cool. Yeah, I know there are a couple places in Utah. One of them that I wanted to try and get back to visit, so the place that I've done some field work in before is the Northhorn Formation. So this is actually our local equivalent here of the Hell Creek Formation. So there is a section from the Lake Cretaceous and into the Paleocene, but it is a pain in the butt <laughs> to get to and drive around because you're basically driving on these dirt mountain roads and the exposures are maybe like a hundred to 500 feet across more or less. And if there's something there, great. But if there's not, then you get back in the car and you drive on more roads until you find another exposure. Like it's very difficult to actually find even just the rock layers that you can find fossils in. So I've heard like that probably is not the best bet. I've since learned that there are other places in sort of Eastern Utah near the Colorado border um, that preserve the boundary as well. That would have been a little bit closer But I thought it was kind of neat that you can go into Google Maps and they use the old name for it. So if you just type in KT Boundary in Google Maps, it will point you to the state park in Trinidad, Colorado. (laughs) And so I said to my girlfriend, who's also a dinosaur fan, do you want to take this 10-hour trip (laughs) one way and back (laughs) this weekend to go see the KPG Boundary? And said, yeah. And it's kind of funny that, you you know, from where I am, we had to drive a total of 10 hours to get to a hike that is less than a quarter of a mile (laughs) before you get to the boundary. But there it was. And I felt it was so important to see it because I'd seen it in museums before. I'd seen like the sections and they often have it displayed with, you know, a diorama of, you know, the the KPG event. I really love the one in San Diego where you have all these little mammals, little insectivores that are on the body of this like crispy style raptor it just looks like they're about to like dig in and like make the most of, of this but i felt it was really important to just to be there to see it in situ to sort of get in touch with it to think about what that means and the fact that we have this record and that it's here and it's part of our modern world that mm-hmm. we have a record of something this ancient that's informing us now and i didn't expect to have necessarily a great epiphany or anything like that but it's one of those if i'm writing a biography basically of this event and what happened it felt wrong to kind of put this out there without going to visit it without like having those moments to like think about it and kind of be present with it and it really is stunning in its own ways saying that stand there and think about like up until this rock layer there were some of our favorite dinosaurs mm-hmm. and just inches above that the world is fundamentally different so this space that I'm looking at that's maybe just a couple inches thick documents some of like the worst things that have ever happened to life on this planet, and yet we're still here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it just in that sense, it was a really powerful moment. Yeah. 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 That's the thing about the the KPG boundary too, is it's in one sense, it's like a terrible thing because you think about, oh man, I really like dinosaurs. There are lots of other cool animals yeah. too. It would have been nice to see. And then on the other hand, you think, well. I mean, we probably wouldn't be here, so (laughs) Mm -hmm. maybe it's not such a bad thing. (laughs) Yeah, it's. I struggle with this, and I have a friend who calls me out on this often, where I say I miss dinosaurs. It's like, well, how can you miss something that like you never saw? But like, I have grown attached to them. I've I've been going to museums ever since I was a little girl. I've been thinking about these animals for such a long time and they become like friends in the sense there's that sense of familiarity and you want to see them alive you want we wonder about these things like how they looked and sounded and how they moved and how they interacted and all that stuff and we know we'll never get that and it's something where like they didn't just kind of fizzle out 
over a long time, or it was a matter of evolutionary progress or any of these old ideas that we used to have, it really was they were struck by a tragedy. And that makes it so much sadder Mm -hmm. in a sense that knowing that otherwise they would have been here. And I don't know if there's a word for like the emotion that exists, but as you were getting at, it's both sort of sorrow and gratefulness. It's like a kind of grief in, in a sense for a world that we have the remnants of, but we'll never get to see directly. I think it's okay to sit with that and just think about for a second, like, yeah, like, I wish I could be there. I wish I could see these animals or there was some representative other than birds, which are great. No disrespect to birds, yeah. but one of our toothy favorite kind of <laughs> dinosaurs still with us now. But if that were true, history would have been so altered that it's unlikely that I'd be here to think about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just one of those, it's like big, heavy thoughts that are probably best had when it's not like after 9 p.m. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, ex- no existential crises, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think Garrett and I, we feel the same way. But the, the end of your book, it read almost like a love letter to dinosaurs. And there's this great quote, dinosaurs live again where our imagination touches bone. Hmm. Just love that yeah. thought. <laughs> Yeah, and that's what the book really is. I, I want it to be like a sense of shared dreaming, in a sense that you know we are imagining this together because we often require that. I feel like often in science communication that there's often this push to say what we know, what has just been discovered, and we kind of treat it as science is this process by which we find something out from nature and then we kind of put it on the shelf and then we know that thing. When in fact, when we talk to a paleontologist, there are any number of questions that we can ask and the answer is well we don't really know mm-hmm. or that's not preserved but we know that you know for example like we don't have an example of a dinosaur's heart you know in the fossil record but we know that they had them because they're <laughs> vertebrates and everything about vertebrates tells us they must have had it that's why i use that example at the end of the book of uh, this book called the uh, the world before the deluge that was published in the 19th century where it was a depiction of archaeopteryx flying over this jurassic forest but it doesn't have a head because at the time the head hadn't been recognized yet. It, the head mm-hmm. was on the fossil slab of the London specimen, but it was thought to be a fossil fish until somebody realized what it was. So the artist drew Archaeopteryx without a head, even though, <laughs> like, that makes no sense. It's a life restoration of a headless animal, where it's like they're trying to be, like, conservative and hue to the science, but it doesn't make any sense. Like, of course it had a head and a skull and teeth and a nervous system and all these sorts of things. So it's like, it's scientifically informed But there's always that sense of imagination with it. Just to pick another brief example, there was T-Rex, the ultimate predator exhibit. The American Museum of Natural History came up and hosted it a couple of years ago. And then there's the Sioux traveling exhibit that I got to see in Denver last year. Both of them have life-size T-Rex restorations in the exhibit, and they look fundamentally different in terms of their body coverings and their colors and even just like the girth of those bodies and what the animals are doing. And to think that, you know, we've known about this animal for more than a hundred years. We probably know more about this particular species than any other non-avian dinosaur. And yet you can have two teams of artists and paleontologists who are all world experts in what they do come up with these very divergent views of what this animal was and how it looked and what it was doing. And I think that's part of the strength of this. It's part of the wonder of it, that it's not something that detracts from it. It's kind of wonderful that like, we have the fossils, we have the bone, we have certain information, but we are always required to use our imaginations, to fill in those gaps, to think about these things and whether they might be possible. And I think that's part of the allure of it. It's like, you can't just look at it and see it wandering out the window, that you need to Think about like what what is this animal to you? How do you how do you see it in your head? And I think that's that's one of the wonderful things about it. Yeah. Agreed. Absolutely. That's why we love paleo art and all the paleo <laughs> community that backs it up too so much. Cause it, it is like sort of the ultimate study in combining science with maybe a little bit of fantasy and but also filling in gaps and going out there and finding new information so you can get a better picture. Mm-hmm. Love it. Same. So for our listeners, where's the best place to find out more about you and your work if they're searching for you online? Yeah, so my website is rileyblack.net, and that's where I post everything about my books and some of my recent articles. And if you want to keep up with sort of what I'm doing in terms of museum visits or field work or things like that, uh, Twitter and Instagram are both laylaps, spelled L-A-E-L-A-P-S. Awesome. And of course, your new book. Of course, yeah. The Last Days of the Dinosaurs is 
out now and I really hope that people like it. Like there's not a dinosaur book, I think, quite like this one out there. And I'm hoping that it kind of opens up just like a new channel of ways to think about these animals in these times. And since I want to be redundant, I want there to be other books like this where we can kind of take the science and really just say like, you know what, we're kind of imagining a lot of these things anyway, that that's required, that's part of the science. So we might as well have some fun with that. Yeah, Definitely. yeah, totally agree. I mean, I couldn't put it down when I was reading it. So hopefully <laughs> that that's... So happy to hear. <laughs> hopefully other people feel the same. <laughs> yeah. yes. Music to a writer's ears. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's always a pleasure. This is great. Thank you so much for having me on. Thanks again, Riley, for the great interview. It's always fun talking to you and catching up on your work. Yes. And we definitely recommend reading her book, The Last Days of Dinosaurs. And real quick, before we get into our dinosaur of the day, we're going to pause for one more sponsor break. And now onto the dinosaur of the day, Macrogryphosaurus, which was a request from PaleoMike716 via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. It was an Elasmarian ornithopod that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Patagonia, Argentina, in the Sierra Barrosa Formation. It looked kind of like a hadrosaur, but with a smaller head and a less bulky body. It had this kind of longish head, a long tail, and it walked on two legs. It's the largest known Elasmarian. I don't know if I've heard of Elasmarians before. They're bipedal. They walked on two legs, they're ornithopods. They used to be thought of as hypsilophodonts. A few other ones include Laelinosaura and Diluvacursor. Oh, okay. Those are both really small. It's interesting to think of one of those, but much bigger. Yeah, because Macrogryphosaurus is estimated to be about 20 feet or 6 meters long, though it might have gotten even larger. Wow, that's big. So it had a long neck and a Silurosaur-like tail. It had 10 long vertebrae in the neck, and it had intercostal plates, these bony structures in the ribs along the side of the torso. It was a short, stiff torso, and a fused bird-like sternum. The type species is Macrogryphosaurus gondwanicus. Hmm. And the genus name Macrogryphosaurus means big enigmatic lizard, and the species name refers to gondwana. It was described in 2007 by Jorge Calvo and others. The fossils were found in 1999 during field work done by the National University of Comahue. A young boy, Rafael Moyano, first found the fossils, and what was found was a nearly complete articulated adult skeleton. It included most of the neck, the thorax, the pelvis, and most of the tail. So it's been described as beautifully preserved. You can see Macrogryphosaurus in Chased by Dinosaurs, which is a sequel to Walking with Dinosaurs. Huh, so I should remember it is what you're saying. Well, <laughs> maybe. I was just thinking we're talking about lots of documentaries today. And other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place as Macrogryphosaurus include the Titanosaurs, Kaiju Titan, and Mendozasaurus, and the Megaraptor, Marus Raptor. And our fun fact for this episode, that's also fun to say. You pretty much took over this episode, I just realized. <laughs> kind of did. <laughs> well, we both watched the David Attenborough documentary, and we both talked to Riley about her book. So. That's true. When it came to the main theme of this episode... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, my fun fact is that theropods evolved stronger jaws over time. And this is based on a paper by Waysa Ma and others published in Current Biology. And they looked at trends in theropod dinosaur feeding mechanics over time. They found that theropods, both carnivores and herbivores, got stronger jaws over time, but they evolved differently to fit their feeding needs. Yeah. Is this the one where it's like the, the fast snapping of the jaws versus the slower grinding force kind of chewing? A little bit. Also, whether the jaw was upturned or downturned, there's a few factors. Another thing that was interesting is that Tyrannosaurids, in particular like Tarbosaurus and Tyrannosaurus, in addition to to these macroevolutionary trends for these two, Tarbosaurus and Tyrannosaurus, they also strengthened their jaws as they grew up, from juveniles to adults. As adults, their jaws were more stress-resistant, and they could bite faster. So, yeah, there's that 
biting faster, but they had a lower bite efficiency compared to juveniles. Mm. And the paper said, quote, this common trend is linked to functional paramorphosis of bone functional adaptation, end quote. And paramorphosis means beyond shape. And it's when a descendant undergoes more development compared to its ancestor. It seems that as some theropods, like Tarbosaurus and Tyrannosaurus, grew up, they had some bone remodeling, which strengthened them in high-strained regions in their jaw to help with their bite. Oh, gotcha. And that was a special adaptation unique to them that their ancestors didn't have? Yes. So in the paper, the team analyzed the feeding mechanics of 43 theropod taxa of 45 theropod mandibles, or jaws. Pretty good amount of jaws. Yeah, so I guess there were a couple of repeats. Yeah, I guess so. And they looked at ornithomimosaurs, therizinosaurs, oviraptors, tyrannosaurs, and dromaeosaurs. They found that herbivorous theropods tended to have a higher bite efficiency compared to carnivorous theropods, but carnivores could close their jaws faster than herbivores, like you'd mentioned, Garrett. Now, carnivores that used their last tooth to bite were more similar in bite efficiency to herbivorous theropods. Hmm. And then interestingly, though, ornithomimosaurs had the lowest average bite efficiency. But anyway, it could be that in general, carnivorous theropods had a lower bite efficiency compared to herbivorous theropods because they had these elongated snouts, which were better suited for capturing prey. Yeah. And in general, just in all forms of thermodynamics, quick things are less efficient than slow things. All the, if you're designing an engine, for example, the most efficient ones move, they sometimes say, infinitely slow. <laughs> because <laughs> there's you know there's less friction it generates less heat from the movement all that kind of stuff yeah so you'd imagine that snapping jaws close is going to be less efficient than just slowly chewing <laughs> like an herbivore might that's true i guess i was thinking before i read this paper that you want it to be efficient so that your prey doesn't manage to escape well efficient is just about how much energy it takes mm. to do the chewing and for a predator, it does, the efficiency isn't a big deal because if you're getting a big meaty meal at the end of it, it's about capturing it. And if you have to spend a little bit more energy and a little bit less efficient of a bite to get it, you go for it. But as an herbivore, when you're just getting minimal nutrients by comparison from plants, oh, yeah. you can't afford for a really inefficient bite. And then you're more likely to evolve that more efficient bite, I would say. Okay, that makes sense. That also kind of goes with what the authors found that herbivorous theropods tended to have downward turned jaws and carnivorous theropods had upturned jaws via this curved bone effect, which would have helped reduce the stress when eating because the upturned jaws, for example, were better for holding onto prey tightly that made it better for hunting. Now, the downward jaw may have been covered with ramphotheca. So the overall shape of that lower jaw would have looked less downturned in life, but it still would have been more, way more downturned than a carnivorous theropod. It's got a big beak on it, yeah. in other words. And that helps it have less stress when they're cropping plants. So yeah, it's interesting. Even though you've got these carnivores and these herbivores, they're all part of the same group and overall, they needed stronger jaws over time to be successful. Yeah, that is interesting. Makes you wonder if it's a similar pressure or if they're unrelated pressures, like the plants are changing so that they need stronger jaws to deal with those plants, and the prey is changing so they need stronger jaws to deal with the prey, or if there's something overall that's changing about the environment. Yeah. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to see all the links from our new stories, as well as Riley Black, then head over to our website, inodino.com, and you can get our full show notes there. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.